One day, Jesus is coming. You may be at church. You may be at work. You may be asleep. God grant that you will be ready when he makes his personal appearance. My God, what if his appearance occurs on a Sunday morning? My prophetic word to you this morning is get ready, get ready! Yevarechecha Adonai v'yishmerecha Yair Adonai pana v'lecha v'yichuneka Yisa Adonai pana v'lecha v'yasem lecha shalom The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. And good morning, everybody. Good afternoon. Happy Sunday. And welcome to this NTEB House Church Sunday service. We're so very, very glad to have you here. Today, the title of my message is Jesus is Knocking on the Church Door and Looking for Last Days Special Ops Volunteers. Is that you? In Revelation 3, We see an astonishing picture of the church. Jesus started on the cross with his own blood, and it's lukewarm and apathetic to the condition of the lost and dying outside of its four walls. Jesus is no longer welcome in this end times affirming church, and he's been thrust out. Now that's the bad news. The good news is that he still stands on the other side of the church door, knocking to see if anybody is interested in breaking away from the crown-losing herd to sign up for a special ops assignment. Revelation chapter 3, verses 20 through 22. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come in to him and will sup with him and he with me. To him that overcometh will I grant to sit with me in my throne, even as I also overcame and am set down with my Father in his throne. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. Gone are the days of worldwide revival seen by the likes of D.L. Moody and others at the end of the 19th century before the falling away would begin. It has been replaced with the easier-to-read modern translations that have no power while smoke machines and laser lights stand in the place of the inquiry room and the mourner's bench. If you really take a good look at the church in 2023, you might be tempted to have nothing to do with it. But before you do, consider this. Even at this late hour, The Lord Jesus stands just outside the church door, and he's knocking. What is he looking for? Any born-again man or woman who was wanting to fight the good fight, finish their course, and keep the faith. Is that you? If it is, Revelation makes you a promise that if you'll answer, the Lord will give you a special ops last day's assignment that will bear crowns at the judgment seat. A word of warning before answering the door, however. Accepting this assignment will cause you to separate from the pack of Laodicean church members who may just make a ministry out of stopping you from completing the mission. You will be fighting against the world, the flesh, the devil, and the corporate church. And you'll be fighting for one more soul to fill one more seat on Flight 777. Is it worth it? Is it really worth it to expend all that effort and trouble and aggravation to spend so much time and treasure on so few souls when the church age is just about to be over anyway? Come with me on this Sunday service and you'll find out. Heavenly Father, 
We thank you, Father God, that even at this late hour, you stand on the other side of that door and you knock and you make a promise. And what a precious promise that that is, that anybody who is born again, saved and sealed unto the day of redemption can open that door. And your word promises that you'll give that person, that soul who wants to get something done for you, a job to do that will get something done for you, that will see lost souls get saved and saved people get on fire for you, even in these last days. And Father God, the the message today is not all gloom and doom. It's not all sag, bag, and drag. There is a light at the end of the tunnel, and that light is you in the clouds coming back to get us as you promised to do. Um, Your word says, Let not your heart be troubled. Ye believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. And I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go, I will come again to receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. And Father God, we hold on to these precious promises today. We ask for an extra unction from the Holy Spirit today. Give us a jump start. Give us a kick start, Lord. Set us back on fire for you. Get us back to our first love. And we'll give you all the honor and the glory for it. And uh, we commit this time to you in Jesus' name Amen. Amen. Is it worth it? All that time, all that trouble. You know, uh, people will ask me about our street preaching ministry. We don't do it as much now as we used to do it 10, 11 years ago because the ministry has gotten so much bigger and God has brought us to new places and new directions. But the heart of this ministry has always been and will always be boots on the ground, handing out gospel tracts, preaching on a street corner. And um, we tell people that we have handed out literally over one million gospel tracts on the corner of St. George and Hippolyta Street. We stop counting at one million gospel tracts. And uh, we preached in the hearing easily of 10 to 15 million people easily over the last 11 years. And then people say, wow, a lot of people must have gotten saved. Well, a bunch of people did. But about two dozen, maybe two and a half dozen people. That's a lot of effort. That's a lot of gospel tracts. That's a lot of Saturday afternoons. That's, that's hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of hours out there uh, in the highways and hedges and compelling people to come in and 24 to 30 souls who prayed to get saved that's great but look at the numbers is it worth it to spend that much time that much effort that much trouble for 24 or 30 people well what if you were one of those 30 people what if your loved one that you've been praying for is one of those 30 people. It would absolutely be worth it to you. So today I want to bring a message on a topic that is absolutely near and dear to my heart. Um, And it goes perfectly with this verse from Acts chapter 20. The Apostle Paul says this, And now behold, I go bound in, in the Spirit unto Jerusalem, not knowing the things that shall befall me there, save that the Holy Ghost witnesses in every city that bonds and afflictions abide me. Paul says, but none of these things move me. Neither count I my life dear unto myself, so that I might finish my course with joy. How is your course coming along? Do you know what your course is? Do you have one? If you're saved, you have one. Do you know what it is? You should spend some time and find out if you don't. And if you do, how's it coming along? But none of these things move me. Neither count I my life dear unto myself, so that I might finish my course with joy and the ministry which I have received of the Lord Jesus to testify the gospel of the grace of God. 
Uh, tonight, we are, Lord willing, going to do part four of our multi-part series uh, on the Apostle Paul. And tonight is going to be especially interesting. We're going to show you how the Apostle Paul starts to write scripture. And we're going to show you a couple of dozen places that he quotes and refers to the Old Testament. And then he puts a New Testament spin on it. And he creates New Testament scripture. And we're going to show you the original verses, the doctrinal application, the prophetical application, the church age application, and the time of Jacob's trouble application. And uh, I hope that that will be a blessing to you. If you've come here today looking for a blessing, you're going to find one because we have God's preserved word. Uh, We are not a church. We are the church. Welcome to church. It's time for us to face the fact that for decades we've ruined our name. Just look around us, it's easy to see that we share the blame. It's on you. of us are hurting, but we have all been called to carry the message to this human race. Our message is love. Our anthem is grace. It's time we remembered who we are. This is the church. If you want 
Amen. There arose a lamb in Jerusalem. And uh, last year, two years ago, we uh, did a Christmas service on Migdal Eder. And it was a blessing to a lot of people. And uh, I love that story of the Levitical shepherds and uh, the baby Jesus in the manger. And uh, it really gives you a fresh look and a new look at what Christmas time is all about. And we understand that Christmas has nothing to do with Christmas trees and Santa Claus and candy canes and all that stuff. But just like with Halloween, it is a time of the year when people's minds are open and receptive to a degree that they're not at other times of the year and uh, we are called we are called to be witnesses of Jesus Christ and and uh, the apostle Paul didn't live in the the time period where they celebrated Christmas uh, he didn't live in the time period where they celebrated uh, Halloween but Paul said he became all things to all men that he might by all means save some 
And uh, what a great time of the year that Christmas time is to witness the gospel of Jesus Christ. And, you know, you get a lot of funny looks from people who are used to Santa Claus and Christmas trees, and you tell them about the little baby Jesus as the sacrificial lamb wrapped up in swaddling clothes and and the angel of the Lord bringing over the Levitical shepherds to inspect him to see if he is worthy to be sacrificed. And man, that that just blows people's minds. And uh, so this year, um, this year, not this year, every year at this time, uh, use Christmas time to hand out gospel tracts. Uh, we ha- hand out thousands of uh, the greatest story ever told tracks at this time of the year. A couple of weeks ago at the bookstore, we had the annual neighborhood Christmas tree and menorah lighting. And so many people in and out of the bookstore, and they're all getting cookies and hot chocolate, and they're all getting gospel tracts with King James Scripture. And uh, so use these things uh, for God's glory. Uh, we are called to be... Um, in the world, but not of the world. And we are called to tell lost and dying people uh, where salvation is and to remind saved people that we too have a judgment coming up and that's called the judgment seat of Christ. And uh, you got to be ready for that. And this, this program today, my message today is going to be indirectly on the judgment seat of Christ. Uh, And it's going to be directly on getting something done for the Lord, even if you're the only person in your church who's willing to stand up and answer that door when you hear the Lord knocking. And um, I could tell you story after story of people just over the last three or four years who have listened to these programs and have gotten motivated and on fire for the Lord. Uh, Kyle Gorzell is one of those people. I can remember the first time that we ever spoke on the phone, and he was telling me that he was a um, lukewarm Laodicean, didn't even have the King James Bible. But he didn't want to remain in that condition. And by the time we spoke on the phone, God was already working on his heart. And today, Kyle and Reagan have a very active and vibrant street corner ministry in Baton Rouge. We have partnered with them on a persistent billboard for the last two and a half years. And people are getting saved on their street corner. And that's how you get the job done. Jesus is knocking. Are you going to answer that door or are you just going to fold your hands and close your eyes and just a little bit of slumber? I hope that's not you today. I hope that you're getting ready for the coming king and the coming kingdom. I wonder if you know him. Don't try to mislead me. Do you know my king? The Bible says he's a king of the Jews. He's a king of righteousness. He's a king of the ages. He's a king of heaven. He's a king of glory. He's a king of kings. And he is the Lord of lords. Now that's my king. Well, no barriers can hinder him from pouring out his blessing. No means of measure can define his limitless love. No far-seeing telescope can bring into visibility the coastline of his solar supply. Well, he's enduringly strong. He's eternally steadfast. He's immortally graceful. He's imperially powerful. And he's impartially merciful. That's my king. He's God's son. He's a sinner's savior. He's a centerpiece of civilization. He's unparalleled. He's unprecedented. He's preeminent. Well, he's the loftiest idea in literature. He's the fundamental doctrine of true theology. He's the miracle of the age. He's the superlative of everything good. He's the only one able to supply all of our needs simultaneously. He's available for the tempted and the tried. He sympathizes and he saves. He heals the sick. He cleansed the lepers. 
He forgives sinners. He delivers the captives. He defends the feeble. He blesses the young. He serves the unfortunate. He regards the age. He rewards the diligent. And he purifies the meek. Do you know him? Do you know my king? Well, my king is a king of knowledge. He's a wellspring of wisdom. He's a doorway of deliverance. He's a gateway of glory. He's a pathway of peace. He's a roadway of righteousness. He's a highway of holiness. His promise is sure. His life is matchless. His goodness is limitless. His mercy is everlasting. His love never changes. His word is enough. His grace is sufficient. His reign is righteous. His yoke is easy and his burden is light. Do you know him? Well, he's incomprehensible. He's invincible. He's irresistible. I'm trying to tell you, the heavens of heaven cannot contain him, let alone a man explain him. You can't get him out of your mouth. You can't outlive him, and you can't live without him. Well, Pharisees couldn't stand him, but they found out they couldn't stop him. Pilate couldn't find any fault in him. The witnesses couldn't get their testimony to agree. Herod couldn't kill him. Death couldn't handle him, and the grave couldn't hold him. That's my king. He always has been, and he always will be. I'm talking about he had no predecessor, and he'll have no successor. There was nobody before him, and there'll be nobody after him. You can't even beat him, and he's not going to resign. That's my king. Yeah. Do you know him? He's the master of the mighty. He's the captain of the populace. He's the head of the heroes. He's the leader of the legislators. He's the overseer of the overcomers. He's the governor of governors. He's the prince of princes. He's the king of kings. And he's the lord of lords. That's my king. Yeah. Heavenly Father, we come before you, Lord, as your body, as your bride, as the church, with our prayers and our praise and our petition. Father God, your word says in Philippians chapter 4, tells us exactly how we are to pray. And you haven't instructed us to pray the Our Father. That's a kingdom prayer. What you've told us to pray is like this, Philippians 4.4. 4. Rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say rejoice. Let your moderation be known unto all men. The Lord is at hand. Be careful for nothing but in everything. By prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your request be made known unto God, and the peace of God which passeth all understanding shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. So, Heavenly Father, today we pray for lost souls. We pray for Sarah and Eric and Becky Jacobs, Greg and Melissa Price, uh, Glenn Clark, Jeanette's granddaughter, Cheyenne, Bridget, and Tony, and boyfriend, Dion, Jeanette's grandbabies, um, and nephew, Matthew, and son-in-law, Samuel, Trista and Tara, Trevor, Derek, Adam, and Roland Carrier and their families, my three brothers, John, Jimmy, and David, Jesse and his mom, Rachel's dad, Ralph, uh, unsaved Catholic family members in the Bolton family, Jordan Shapiro, David Peck, Susan Weir's Bicky, praying for her children and her husband to get saved. Um, Jeffrey is praying for Tyler, Tevin, daughter-in-law, Caitlin, and grandsons, Logan, Ronnie, and Russell. Jeanette and Bob from Wisconsin, Catholic family members, Connie, unsaved children, Brandy, unsaved family members, Rita in Colorado praying for son Dan, 
Spray of Sunshine Sons, Daniel Patrick and Brian. Shannon praying for Lori W. and Brian M. David Lacker needs to get saved. Barbara praying for Robert, Naomi, Blake, Alex, Ethan, Raquel, Janet, and Shandell. Nicole Zimmer praying for the Meads and the Cooks. Cheyenne praying for Barry K., Terry C., Alan G., Melody, Nick Rick, and Beth. Karen's children, Jason and Tiffany, grandchildren, Summer, Austin, and Emmett. Barbara's son, Jody, Mark Sherlock, praying for Savannah and Mom Stephanie. Werner Bukes, praying for Bob and Abby. Nancy, praying for Brandon and Michelle. Junie Grant and their dad need to get saved. Kathy Hughes' son for salvation. Haley C., praying for Zane, Lulu, unsaved family members. Miles and his family needs to be saved. Many family members in the Giacomino family. Dawn D., praying for David. Paul Caulfield, praying for uh, Father Fred, brother-in-law Frank. Ramona Hayes, praying for daughter Kimberly. Uh, She needs to get saved and delivered from alcohol. Also, salvation prayer for grandchildren, William, Jason, David, Amanda, and their families. Patrick, praying for Jack and Aaron. Chelsea P., praying for her ex-husband, his parents, um, his sister, and her husband. Adam's wife, Shanna, Lori B., Shira Shine, praying for children Scott, Sherry, and Nicole, as well as emotional healing to go along with the spiritual healing. Lori Ann's grandfather, Irvin, Mark Fennell, Kevin Thompson, praying for his father, Tim, and various family members, Steve Graves, Elga, Rob, praying for three children, Max, Olivia, and Mikey, Phyllis T., praying for her husband, Uh, Summer Robbins praying for her dad, Brian Robbins. Tad Broom's brother, Thad. Marie's friends, family, Ashley, Dayton, Alyssa, Kyle, Brandon, Grace, Micah, and Macy. Adam and Katie praying for parents, sisters, brother-in-law, nieces, and nephews. Joe Rusiello praying for his mom, sister, granddaughter, and in-laws. Ellen praying for grandsons, Braden and Logan. His Grace would like salvation prayer for Rob, Sue, Summer and Mike, Carl, Jason and Rachel, and Jason and Carrie. Lola's son, William and wife, Lindsay, Hannah's mom. Anja, praying for Hanu, John, Charles, and Anna Lilsa. Dave Evans, praying for his friend, Taylor, an atheist. Viviana, her brother, Javier Reyes. Adam and Katie, praying for neighbors, Jason, Eddie, and Brian. Loretta Oates is praying for her son, Kenny and Matthew. Jane praying for Troy, Julie Lynn for Katie Ann. Chona praying for Estefano Jr., Eugenia and her kids. Maricel and Cherry and Chona's siblings, Julia and Maria Tricia. Chuck Edgerton praying for his son, Jacob and mom, Lynette. Samantha praying for Beth, Deborah Hare, unsaved family members. Rita also has, uh, in addition to her son, Dan, other unsaved Catholic family members. Uh, Teresa, unsaved family members. Lisa praying for her dad, John. Annabelle, unsaved kids. Deborah Milton, son, Billy. Hap Nightingale, sons, Jimmy and Zach. Don Huff, Claire and Virginia. Norman Merkel praying for his daughter, Kara. Granddaughter, Ava. Son-in-law, Stephen Matthews and for Lynette Crew, Henrique Larson, praying for his parents, Kai Jell and Elizabeth, uh, his sister and spouse, Ingrid and Frederick, his mom's aunt, Barrett. Roz, praying for lost family members, Brian needs to get saved, Andrew Whittington. Marisol Barcina, praying for her Catholic family members in Panama. Rapture 57, unsaved family members, Gail, praying for Jim. Shirley Medor, praying for her brother and his wife. Eric Brian Yui, praying for his parents, Anna and Norillo, members of his family and co-workers. Uh, Tony the Carpenter and his son, Cole. Kenny B., unsaved family. Rachel K., unsaved family. Sandra C., unsaved family. There's a lot of that. Uh, Marky Mark, praying for unsaved relatives and neighbors. Regina Danner. 
Kelly, Chris, Cisco, Richard, Wayne, John, Sandra, Tamara, Hazel, and Jimmy. Haley's aunt for salvation, Carol from Georgia, uh, family members, the Breda family, Stacy Bunton praying for her husband's salvation, Rachel Adams praying for Kim, Jesse, Angelina, Carrie, Mikey, Alyssa, and Stan, Ashley for salvation and addiction, Mark praying for his sons, Michael, Matthew, Mason, and daughter, Michaela, Mitch praying for his daughters, Rachel and Hannah, um, the delivery people who service the bookstore, Jericho praying for his family, Brenda's husband, Paul, for salvation, Ramona Hayes, and she's been on the list with the same prayer for years now, and uh, we will keep her on the list. Um, Look, it doesn't matter how long it takes for God to answer your prayer. Sometimes it's quick. Sometimes it takes a a while. Sometimes your prayer won't be answered until after you have gone home to be with the Lord. It's not about the time element. It's about you lifting up somebody else. That's what prayer is all about. And um, uh, if you've had an update, If you've been on the list for quite some time, and if you've had an update, please uh, reach out to myself or Jeanette or Lorianne and let us know so that we can keep this list fresh. And um, if you have had a prayer request uh, that has somehow gotten dropped off the list, just reach out and we'll be very, very happy to put it back on. The list is a massive list and it's constantly being updated and sometimes things get removed. Uh, And um, if that's the case with you, just let us know and we'll be very happy to put you back on. Many of these prayers have been on here for years, but just a couple of weeks ago, we're rejoicing that Colby Bohan got saved. Well, his wife had us put him on the list at the start of the pandemic, (laughs) and he gets saved a month ago. So uh, don't worry about the time element. Just put it up before the Lord and let him work and move. Kenny, salvation prayer for friends and family. Amanda, praying for Melanie and Payden. Uh, Jericho, praying for his three older brothers and their families. The Muto family, Steph praying for Michael, Terry uh, for her family, Xavier praying for his mother Reyes, wife Salma, and various family members, Maria Silva praying for her Jehovah's Witness family in Venezuela, Donna Lynn's children, Shannon, Todd, Kaylin, and Jake, Tiffany Brown for her mother-in-law, the La Piana family asking salvation prayer for extended family members. Dave Evans for his friend Diana, Sue Duchesne's son Norman. CJ's mom, Shira Shine, praying for Kevin, Michelle, and Lewis. Loretta Wozni's husband and children, Rebecca Lynn, Joel Smith. Shirley praying for Marie, Haley, Patricia, Jaden, Richard, Patricia S., Joshua, Ruby, Gerald, Josiah, Monice, and her husband, Hamid. Mary Ann Ellie's kids, Anne Marie and Christine, grandkids, Sophia, Jacob, David, and Katrina, Tracy and Ralph Wallace, um, son in law Ethan, daughter Shanna, and grandson Caden, um, everybody in the Peck family except for Beth, Terry Ewing's daughter Bryn, Teresa M. sons James, Frank, and Peter, Jose De La Rosa's mom Alicia. Patricia T. praying for son Adam, stepsisters and stepmother. Chelsea and Brian Plagman praying for son Bryce and girlfriend Eva. Zuzana. Vladimira asking prayer for husband Ken and friend Katka. Steph, brother Michael, Cassandra praying for her husband Todd and sons Nathan and Andrew. Uh, Also for her son Sonny who is saved but backslidden. Marie Sim, uh, please pray for my ex-husband who is a Mason. Uh, Jean-Paul Mesa, Catholic mom and family members. Aunt Nancy, Brandon and Michelle. Deborah Mack, please pray for John and Brenda for salvation. 
people who need a healing today. Anetta, who had a stroke in 2022. David, uh, his mom, Laura, had a stroke last month. And David, if you're listening, please give us an update. Uh, Mike Hensel's mom. We need an update on her, but uh, he has been asking for prayer for her. Sadie has heart-related issues. Derek O'Reilly has anxiety. Kevin Thompson has light headaches. Daniel in Australia, please pray for a healing in my marriage, God's blessing on my kids, recovery from various health issues for my wife and myself, and to find a good Bible-believing church. Marcia Swanson has myalgic encephalomyelitis that affects her health in many ways. George H. has health issues. James Rivette, recovering from addiction and mental health issues. Robert Wiley, battling ALS. Jill Puckett's losing her vision. Paul Caulfield has type 1 sugar diabetes. Um, and um, he wrote us a very encouraging letter the other day. And uh, we very much appreciate the support from Paul and Peggy Caulfield up in Canada. Uh, Ron Alliston has cancer. Brooke Kettlecamp, recovering from autism. My friend Krista, battling a massive tumor in her chest. Um, Multiple text messages have not been returned over a two and a half week period. Please pray for her and her family. Dan Kane, wife Roxy with MS and son Jonathan. Rob's friend Mike has MS. Ida Karulik has cancer. Mark Seals, numerous health issues. Roz, asthma and scoliosis. Tony is blind, has cancer, and his wife is divorcing him. Maddie Luck, that's another one who was on the list and she somehow got dropped. And she said, please put me back on. And uh, we certainly did. She says, I have Luli body dementia. I feel so much better when I know my NTEB family is praying for me. Amen. She said, also, my daughter Michelle has neuropathy and fibromyalgia. Tracy has severe arthritis and diabetes type 2. Linda Pippin, fibromyalgia and neuropathy. Michelle Christian has bone cancer. Melissa B's husband, Brian, has stage 3 kidney disease. Angela, recovering from surgery. Ricky Gouda needs prayer for her eyesight. Daughter, Norcha, um, complications with thyroid. Casey is a woman with lupus and kidney issues. Jane wants salvation prayer for parents and brother. And um, her husband has a tumor inside his nerves on his spine. Ashley has MS. Jackie H. needs God's favor regarding custody of her son. Vladimir's friend Katka has ALS. Dave Evans' friend Manuela has bone marrow cancer. Stacy going through a divorce and needs wisdom. Terry Horn has had several strokes and needs prayer. Casey, her husband, is a severe alcoholic and needs to get saved. Uh, Matthew Morrow, he is an alcoholic who has relapsed and his parents, Dan and Peggy, are asking for prayer. Zach Jeffson, uh, please pray for my mom. And I don't have an update on that, or maybe I do. But she has a tumor on her carotid artery. So please pray for Jack Jeffson's mom. Tony Rance is recovering from a stroke and a severe brain bleed. Julius, please continue to pray for my mother, Erlinda. And we've been praying for her for a long time. And for my niece, Rochelle, who's currently undergoing medication from kidney failure. Also, please continue including me on the unspoken list. Um, Jeanette's sister, Kisabel, is recovering nicely from eye surgery. Amen. Ashley DeShields. She says, I am the 13th person in Virginia this year to be diagnosed with West Nile virus. It has attacked my nervous system and my joints. So please pray for Ashley. Brooke's friend, Birdie had a stroke, and then seizures. So please pray for her friend, Birdie. Ladies who are expecting, our daughter, Megan Burton, 
Shira Shine's daughter-in-law, Christy Ireland, Char's daughter Miranda, Sandra Carbonera's friend Jordan P., Stephanie Juliana and her sister Christina, Sarah Ann Severson, she's the daughter of Bob and Cindy Kettlecamp, and she's expecting uh, her first in May. And new grandmother Brenda Clark wants prayer for new granddaughter Cassandra, who was born preemie about five weeks ago. And please pray for mom Stephanie as well. Mark Saxa would like his son Joseph to return to the Lord. Jan Lacker update. Son David for salvation. My son with disabilities. That the Lord would protect him from evil. Amen. My husband, if not saved, pray for his salvation, for his healing. Also, please pray for a healing in our marriage for the glory of God. Amen. And she says, for me, that I would stay healthy to have knee surgery on the 28th. And um, we will be very happy to pray for all of those things. Shar says, please pray for our jail ministry to be reopened again. Linda wants prayer for her son Stephen to return to the Lord. Richard Herrera wants prayer to be able to understand what he reads better in God's word. Um, Amanda needs prayer for upcoming testing after an abnormal pap smear praise report. Her test results came back normal, no cancer, and we rejoice with you. What a blessing that is. Julie Baird uh, needs prayer about her living situation and finances. Deborah Mack says, please pray for Devin Miller. Uh, People with an unspoken. The LaPiana family, Jeanette, Adrienne P. Breda, Debbie Matthias, Rachel Adams, Julius, Dave Evans, Ricky Gouda, Blaine, Jennifer, Carol from Georgia, Ron M., Erad Byramumishu, Bonnie, Marie Comfort, Julie Baird, Amanda Stern, Rob, Steph, Marie C., Julius, Mona and Leah, Angela, and Brooke. Also, Street Preacher Marie uh, for tear duct surgery, and that's coming up. Finally, please remember our um, free Bible and gospel track program, as well as our overseas pastors. In the Philippines, pastors John Ree, Danny, and Arnell. In Vietnam, Pastor Fo John in Turkey. Luan, who is an American missionary to the Muslims. In India, Pastor David Mark. In the UK, Stephen McCarroll. In Uganda, Irad Bairumumishu. In Spain, we have Xavier. Also, please remember our NTEB street preachers. In the United States, we have Brian Kelly. He's the pastor of the King James Bible Baptist Church in New York City. Kyle and Reagan Gorzell in Baton Rouge. Marie in Philadelphia. Mike Avram is a trucker who leaves Bibles at truck stops. Jay is a street preacher to the LGBTQ in New York. Joseph Rusiello in Eagle Pass, Texas. Joshua Gaskins, Gospel Track Ministry in Virginia, and Aaron and Teresa McMahon for their CPR missions. And um, we have taken them on for support, which is going to start January of 2024. Uh, We will be financially supporting the ministry of Aaron and Teresa McMahon and look for an upcoming podcast Um, with Aaron about that ministry and God is really using them in a mighty way. Uh, It inspires me to hear how God is using them and it will inspire you as well. Up in Canada, Paul and Peggy Caulfield, Adrian P. Breda, Werner Bukes, South Africa, Arthur Hueys, and in Australia, we have Henry Biggs and Jennifer Thompson. You know, I don't take for granted for a single second that Now the End Begins is a global worldwide ministry. And, um, you know, when you hear us talk about all these people that we're connected with all around the world, um, God will always, in every dispensation, he will look for a remnant who wants to get something done. And if you're saved today and if you're on fire for God, well, Welcome to the remnant. That's where we are today. Let's go to the chat room and see what we have percolating there. 
Uh, Jeff Ward says, Unspoken for me, stuck between a rock and a hard place. And that's exactly where the Lord does his best work. Erad Bairumumishu, next Saturday is our children's Christmas dinner. Pray that God would give us good weather and bless our primary goal of seeing people getting saved. Um, if you haven't donated to this, uh, there is still time to do that. Jeanette or Lori or Erad will put the link into the chat room. Now the End Begins has donated. We've donated personally. Um, now the End Begins supports Erad on many, many different levels, and we have done that for years. And um, we we absolutely endorse his efforts for the children's Christmas dinner next week. Um, and if somebody wants to put the donate link for him in the chat room, that would be a blessing. Wade, please pray for me and my wife, Kernessa, to get rid of this upper respiratory condition. Uh, the worst part is extreme fatigue. Amen, brother. We're praying for you. Linda, my dear friend in the hospital, they think it's her heart. And my grandson-in-law's grandmother has had her second stroke. Uh, Angela, prayers for the lost who don't know they're lost. Amen. Juanita, unsaved family co-workers. Um, Jesus is Lord. Please pray for Ralph, Lori, and Scott. They are very angry and need prayer for salvation. Regina Danner, safe travels for Kelly and Jennifer coming home for Christmas. Amen. Um, all right, here we are. Update from Jack, Jack, Zach Jeffson. Um, good news. The test and the results from Monday show that the tumor is not cancerous. Uh, they're going to do a CT scan and then send her home. So please pray for Zach's mom for a full recovery, as well as for Mike Hensel's mom. Jeanette's sister has an eye infection in the eye the surgery was done on. So she's not out of the woods yet. Uh, so please pray for Kisabel. Uh Heath, I need all the prayers I can get. Um, I appreciate it more than you'll ever know, and it does help. And we are very happy to pray for you. Uh, look, there's no prayer that's too big or too small. There's no prayer that's too inconsequential or too overwhelming. I get people writing, you know, fairly often. I know it's not about a person, but could you pray for my pet? And we are thrilled to pay to pray for people's pets um god gave us these animals these beautiful comforting animals um for a reason they're god's creation and um we'll pray for whatever your need is and we'll do it happily heavenly father lord that's the whole list 200 plus names for salvation Dozens and dozens and dozens of hardcore diseases and injuries and strokes and heart attacks and who knows what else. Lord, you got to do it. You got to get it in the middle of that thing. Um, I got nothing against modern medicine or doctors or hospitals, but, but, but Lord, you're the great physician and you got to do it. And we know that you will. And this is why we pray. This is why that we ask. And uh, we know that you hear us. And Lord, we commit all these prayers to you, along with the unspoken prayers of our hearts. And we confess our dependence upon you today, uh, not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but Lord, but by your mercy, you have saved us. And uh, Lord, for everybody who needs to be healed, restored, reinvigorated, um, whatever that needs to be done, we ask you to do it. And uh, Lord, let it be for your glory and for our good. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, one more song and then right into our message for today. Uh, it's going to be Revelation. Revelation 14 to the end of the passage. And uh, this is a topic that I have spoke about, taught about, preached about dozens of times over the years. And we're going to 
uh, dig it up again today and see if we can find something new. And uh, of course we can, because God's word is like that. We'll be right back after this. Open your Bibles, please, to Revelation chapter 3, and let's get right into the message for today. If you're just tuning in, uh, my message is going to be on stepping away from the Laodicean lukewarm church. 
And uh, we are not against church. We are not preaching against church attendance. Uh, We are not preaching about anything like that. What we're preaching about is... Uh, we are preaching about stepping away and overcoming that very pervasive, lukewarm spirit of inertia that Revelation chapter 3 says is going to engulf the professing Christian church in the last days. Revelation chapter 3, verse 14. And unto the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write, These things saith the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. I know thy works, that thou art neither cold nor hot. I would thou wert cold or hot. So then, because thou art lukewarm, and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. Because thou sayest, I am rich and increased with goods, and have need of nothing, And knowest not that thou art wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked? I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire, that thou mayest be rich, and white raiment, that thou mayest be clothed, and that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear, and anoint thine eyes with eye salve, that thou mayest see. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten, be zealous, therefore, and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him and will sup with him and he with me. To him that overcometh will I grant to sit with me in my throne, even as I also overcame and am set down with my father in his throne. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. Heavenly Father. We thank you, Lord, for this place, this time, this ministry, this platform. God, we thank you for the King James Bible. We thank you for your preserved word. And Lord, um, be with me as I teach and preach and uh, the message that you put on my heart. uh, Let it come out the way that you gave it to me and we'll give you all the honor and the glory for it, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen, amen, and amen. All right, so let's talk, let's talk about the Laodicean church. I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time on it because the whole point of this message is getting you to overcome the spirit of Laodicea. Uh, But there is uh, a clip that I have, and I'm just going to play one clip today. And this clip, more than any other, shows you the problem with the Laodicean church in our day. And it is a very real and very serious problem. Have you ever seen that movie from the 1950s called The Blob? And I can remember watching that when I was a kid. And basically, um, if you have ever watched... Nickelodeon with the green slime. The movie The Blob was like this massive pile of slime that just took over the entire town. And uh, there's this one scene where they're in the movie theater and the blob is coming through the air conditioning vents and it's just, it's on the floor, it's on the walls and it's creeping toward the people. And as the people are, they go running out in horror out into the streets, but there's nowhere to go because this blob is slow moving, but it's everywhere. Now, that's what the lukewarm spirit of the Laodicean church is. They have the wrong gold. Jesus says, I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire. You want to be rich? You need the gold that he has. You want to have the right clothes? It's not a $2,000 suit. It's not stretchy jeans. It's white raiment that thou mayest be clothed. You want to be able to see properly? You don't need LASIK surgery. You need eye salve that thou mayest see. And what opens your eyes? Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. That's what opens your eyes. So I just want to play this clip. Let's just set the table today. 
when we talk about the lukewarm Laodicean church, they are lukewarm to the things of God. But they're not lukewarm to everything. They're pretty hot about a number of things. But unfortunately and sadly, they are hot about the things that God hates. So, let's just listen to Pastor Danny DeArmis from the First Orlando Baptist Church talking about the type of people that they seek to populate their pews. Take a listen. We have longtime members of 50 plus years greeting and welcoming new people who are walking in for the very first time. We have those who love traditional music and hymns and those who know only contemporary music. We have choir lovers and non-music lovers, a pipe organ and loud electric guitars. We have the 99-year-old World War II hero and the millennial immigrant who doesn't know anything about American history sitting on the same row and listening and learning about Jesus together. We have transgender, LGBTQ, straight, single, married, divorced, and cohabitating people. These same people attend, listen, serve, grow, and give. We have Democrats, Republicans, independents, and non-registered people. We have documented and undocumented people. We have politically active and socially responsible people. We have pro-life and pro-choice and pro-war and pro-peace. We have support the blue and Black Lives Matter, sitting together and serving together. We have Trumpers and never Trumpers. We have Biden supporters and Harris supporters. We have the ultra wealthy and the indigent sitting together, singing together, and serving together. We have the social elite and the social outcast. We have the best dressed and the barely dressed. And in the midst of all of this, we have one of the most beautiful worship experiences you can possibly imagine. Because all of us gather around the good news of Jesus and the one who is changing us and the one who unifies us. And we celebrate how he has set us all free from our bondage to sin and given us eternal life. Jose, we are First Orlando. So they have everything but discernment. Uh, They have everything that you could possibly imagine and uh, they are appealing to everybody and come as you are and stay as you are. And uh, that is just a big, fat, sloppy, mongrel mess. And uh, sadly, sadly, uh, First Baptist Orlando is really very, very typical. Now, they're a very large church. But it's very, very typical of your Laodicean church in the last days. Now, let's look, let's do a little Bible study in Revelation chapter 3, all right? Verse 14, And unto the angel of the Laodiceans write, These things saith the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning and the, of the creation of God, I know thy works. And Jesus says, you're not cold, you're not hot, you're right there in the middle. And where is First Baptist Orlando? They are right there in the middle. And by his own testimony, he places himself smack dab in the middle. And you don't ever want to be in the middle. You want to be on the Lord's side. And uh, This prophecy in Revelation chapter 3, this prophecy on the end times church before the rapture, um, this absolutely and sadly continues to come true every single day of the week. Now, Jesus says in verse 16, because you're right there in the middle and you're lukewarm and you are not hot or cold about the things I would desire you to be hot or cold about, he said, I will spew thee out of my mouth. Is that a loss of salvation? No. That is a loss of rewards at the judgment seat of Christ. And he says, verse 17, because thou sayest I am rich and increased with goods. Um, 
What does James say about riches in the last days? People who have their money in the wrong bank. James 5.1 Go to now, ye rich men, weep and howl for your miseries that shall come upon you. Your riches are corrupted and your garments are moth-eaten. Your gold and silver is cankered and the rust of them shall be a witness against you. And James says, you have heaped treasure together for the last days. And that's why Jesus says in verse 18, you have the wrong gold. And I counsel you to come to me And I'm going to give you the gold that you need, the clothing that you need, and the perspective that you need to have in the last days. Verse 19 says, As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. So, what is the context? The context is, it is the the closing hours of the church age. We are waiting for the pre-tribulation rapture. You turn the page and go to Revelation chapter 4. After this I looked and behold a door was opened. And what do we see? It's John in a type of the rapture. And he's going up. And he says, after this I looked. After what? The seven ages of the church over a 2,000 year period. And Jesus says this. In verse 20, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him and will sup with him and he with me. Now, the context is not salvation. I don't see lost people. I mean, every church has lost people. But, I don't see in this context, I don't see any lost people. I see lukewarm Laodiceans. And Laodicea was a legitimate church in the time of Paul and in the time of John. Colossians chapter 4 verse... Well, keep your finger in Revelation 3 and turn to Colossians chapter 4. A lot of people are surprised when they read this for the first time. Colossians 4.13, Paul says, For I bear him record that he hath a great zeal for you and them that are in Laodicea and them in Hierapolis. Luke, the beloved physician, and Demas greet you. Salute the brethren which are in Laodicea and Nymphus and the church which is in his house. So, It looks like the church of Laodicea was in the house of Nymphus. And uh, Paul says this in verse 16. And when this epistle, Colossians, is read among you, the people of Colossae, cause that it be read also in the church of the Laodiceans, Nymphus' house church, and that ye likewise read the epistle from Laodicea. And then, of course, the next verse, and say to Archippus, Take heed to the ministry which thou hast received in the Lord, that thou fulfill it. And I'm going to be touching on that verse in just a little bit. So, back to Revelation chapter 3. Do you see what Laodicea was like in the days of Paul when he's writing Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, and Colossians? Laodicea was a born-again New Testament house church. And at the very least, it was in the house of Nymphus. It may have been in other people's houses. The Bible doesn't say. The Bible also doesn't say what happened to that letter that Paul wrote to the Laodiceans. Wouldn't you like to read that letter? I sure would like to get my hands on that letter. Uh, There's a lot of people who'd like to read what Paul wrote to the Laodiceans. Um, And he even said, make sure that you people in Colossae get a hold of that letter that I wrote to Laodicea and make sure that you read it among your people. So there must have been some sort of Bible doctrine 
in Paul's letter to the Laodicean church. So there's a tendency, there's a tendency among Bible students to kind of dismiss this church in Laodicea from Revelation chapter 3 as some sort of futuristic, far-flung, end times. No, this church existed in the first century. Paul wrote to this church. Paul might even have started this church. Nymphus was probably one of Paul's or Barnabas's or Silas's converts. So, in Revelation chapter 3, the message to the Laodiceans. Why can't we say that this is the message to the Laodicean church that Paul talks about in Colossians chapter 4? So, I said all that to say this. When we're reading this message to Laodicea, unto the angel of the church of the Laodiceans, this is not lost people. There may be lost people in the church and likely are, just like at the first Baptist Church of Orlando, um, where they're doing everything to everyone on every level. Um, That church probably has a 50% level of lost people sitting in those pews. I mean, I can't imagine it would be any less than at least half of everybody in that church uh, would not be saved. Now, in Revelation chapter 3, Now that we understand the context, as many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. So, in the context, Jesus is speaking to the Laodicean church. And again, we're just going to assume as a point of fact that this is the same church or one of the churches that Paul was writing to in Colossians chapter 4. And Jesus is outside of the door of the church and he's saying, I am knocking. Why is he knocking? Because he wants somebody to open the door. Why is nobody opening the door? Because they can't hear the knock. They're not listening for the knock. Uh, Keep your finger in Revelation 3 and turn to 2 Timothy 4. Turn to 2 Timothy chapter 4. Look at verse 8. 2 Timothy 4, 8. Paul says this, Henceforth, because I fought a good fight, I finished my course, I kept the faith. Henceforth, there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day, and not to me only, but unto all them also that love his appearing. I can remember when I was a little boy, and my dad would come home from work at roughly the same time every single day night, Monday through Friday, typical 1960s suburban North Jersey lifestyle, and dinner was at six o'clock, and and dad came home with the briefcase and the hat, and you know, just as typical as you could possibly be, but I can remember as a small little boy, and I would be sitting in the chair by the window looking, looking for my dad to come home. Why? Because I love him. And anything that you love, you're looking for. And Paul says that, look, I fought a good fight. I finished my course. I kept the faith. Follow me as I follow Christ. And because of that, if you do that, you're going to get a crown if you love the appearing of the Lord. So how does this apply? Go back to Revelation 3. How does this apply to what we're talking about? Let's just say that you attend a church where the Laodicean lukewarm spirit is in abundance. Well, let me tell you something. They may have the NIV, the ESV, and the Legacy Standard Bible in the pulpit, but you're sitting there in your pew with the King James Bible. I know that you are. And I know many, many people who do that. Um, 
And, and sometimes when a church goes bad, the people have been there for three years, five years, 10 years, 20 years, and they don't want to leave. And they feel that they're, you know, being pulled like saltwater taffy in both directions. They don't want to leave, but they don't like staying because the church has gone liberal. So they sit there in their pew with the King James Bible and they try to get something from it. Now, those people, whoever they are, and if you're one of those people and you're in the chat room, just raise your hand and let me know. But those people, whoever they are, sitting there, undercover Bible believers, um, and they're reading their King James Bible as the pastor preaches from an NIV. And what are they waiting for? What are they looking for? They're waiting for the Lord to come as he promised to do. You go to the vast majority of these big churches, and they're not preaching on the pre-tribulation rapture. They're not preaching on the judgment seat of Christ. You know what they're preaching on? Seven steps for 12 steps to the three steps to get what you want. That's what they're preaching on in these churches. That's why so many people come and they have a 5,000 seat church because everybody's looking to come to get their blessing. They don't want to be the blessing. They want to be blessed. But Jesus says this in Revelation 3.20, Behold, I stand at the door of your church and I'm knocking. If you can hear, if you can hear my knocking, I want you to open the door. I want you to open the door. On the podcast, um, we have this clip that we used to play during the pandemic uh, from the movie The Terminator. And that great scene where he's talking over the microphone and he says, if you can hear this, you're the resistance. And uh, great scene from that movie. Well, it kind of applies in Revelation 3.20. When we kind of swim around this verse, we see Jesus outside the church. He's been put outside because they don't want the old paths. They don't want the narrow way. Um, they don't want the old book. They want an app on their mobile device. Jeremiah 6.16, Thus saith the Lord, Stand ye in the ways and see, and ask for the old paths. Where is the good way? And walk therein, and ye shall find rest for your souls. But they said, we will not walk therein. Well, that's exactly what the Laodicean church is saying. We don't want the old paths. They're boring. We don't want saved by the blood of the crucified one. We want this 27-minute chorus that only has five words that repeat on an endless loop. That's what they want. And that is the spirit of Laodicea. Um, you can't get, look, many, many times I have been in a church service and um, playing these songs like Saved by the Blood of the Crucified One, Pass Me Not, What a Friend We Have in Jesus, and the list goes on and on and on. And uh, many, many times, uh, those songs cause me to stand up and shout amen, or it brings a tear to my eye, or it causes me to turn to a passage of scripture. The modern choruses just lull you into a stupor. They just lull you into this middle of the road, lukewarm sense of existence, which is the whole point behind these choruses. But Jesus says, I stand at the door and knock, Revelation 3.20. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him. He's not coming into the church. He's going to let it be what it's going to be. Um, what does it say? Uh, I think it's in Revelation 22. Um, yeah, here it is. Revelation 22... Verse 10, and what I'm about to say goes perfectly with Revelation 3. 
And if you notice, this is off of the timeline. Uh, Revelation 22, starting in verse um, 8. It goes back to the beginning of the timeline. Revelation 22.10, And he saith unto me, Seal not the sayings of the prophecy of this book, for the time is at hand. He that is unjust, let him be unjust still. And he which is filthy, let him be filthy still. And he that is righteous, let him be righteous still. And he that is holy, let him be holy still. And behold... I come quickly and my reward is with me to give every man according as his work shall be. Revelation 3.20 Behold, see the harmony here? I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him and will sup with him and he with me. To him that overcometh. And I hope that I have spent sufficient time on this passage so that you can see Revelation 3.21 To him that overcometh will I grant to sit with me in my throne even as I also overcame. Now, what are we being called to overcome in the passage, in the context? We understand that Revelation 3.20 is not an invitation for salvation. This is a message to a church where the people are presumed to be saved who are sitting in the seats. This is not an invitation to salvation. This is an invitation to get something done for the Lord. This is an invitation to roll up your sleeves and work. To him that overcome, overcometh what? the lukewarm spirit of the Laodicean church of the last days. That's what you are called to overcome in this passage, in this context. Yes, as Christians, in our daily life, we battle the world, the flesh, and the devil, and we there's lots of things that we are called to overcome depending on what uh, uh, scripture that you're reading. Go through 1 Thessalonians and go through uh, Galatians and Ephesians and you'll see lots of things um, that Christians are called to overcome. But in this passage here, we are called to overcome the lukewarm spirit of the Laodicean church. Let me tell you a couple of quick anecdotes. When we started the free, not the free Bible program, the Bibles Behind Bars program, That started back in the middle of the summer of 2022. And a lot of people get excited about the free Bible program, and rightly so. But do you think that everybody gets excited about the free Bible program? Would you believe that over the last 14 months, 15 months, uh, I have received multiple emails from people telling me, What a waste of time and effort and money it is to try and give Bibles to prisoners. People have written to me and they have said they chose to commit the crime. Let them pay for their crimes. Let them die behind bars. And let's not waste any money trying to send them Bibles to see those people get saved. Now, thankfully... That is the overwhelming vast minority. I've only gotten about four or five emails with that theme, but it's but I've gotten some. And when I get an email like that, I try to imagine what is going on in the heart and the head of somebody who claims to be a Christian, and yet they're not interested in seeing prisoners get saved. So, um, people have said a lot of complimentary things about the Bibles Behind Bars program, but it's not all complimentary. There are people who look at that and they say, we shouldn't be doing that. Um, Last Friday on the podcast, I shared on the podcast um, about this church in Nocatee, Florida. Ponte is the name of the town. And um, I 
I shared this story about one of the women that attends that church. And uh, the church for many, many years has been affiliated with Rick Warren and the Purpose Driven Church Movement. And um, I have heard from multiple people that the pastor of that church, the lead pastor, would stand up and simply read from a printout of one of Rick Warren's sermons. And it was absolutely as Laodicean as you could possibly ever hope to see. Well, a couple of weeks ago, uh, Lori Ann received a message from a woman named Daniela, and she attends that church. She's not on staff. Um, she, she's, she is just simply a church member um, who is very excited about the new pastor, Pastor Josh, and he is looking to make some changes. And I've, I've shared with it, this with you multiple times. She reached out to us and said, would it be possible to have the free Bible program help us to put King James Bibles um, into our church? Well, we met with Pastor Josh and with her and her husband. Lori and I sat down with them and we spoke for a two and a half hour period. And if you go to, to the church's website now, it still looks like a Rick Warren style church. And, and uh, there's lots of funky things happening over there. But the new pastor, he's only been the new pastor for a very short period of time. Um, the new pastor is looking to make changes. Uh, he is looking to, to, to get something done. And um, Daniela decided to lead the charge. Now, um, just to let you know how new that this is, Pastor Josh became the official head pastor of Crosswater Church December 10th of 2023. Now, I'm not good with math, but I know that today is the 17th. And I know that if I subtract 10 from 17, I'm going to get 7. This guy, Pastor Josh, has only been the pastor at this church, the head pastor, for one week. So if you go to their website, you're going to see some crazy things. If you go to their doctrinal statement, you're going to see some crazy things. But there is a huge change that's taking place in this Rick Warren purpose-driven church in one of the richest neighborhoods in all of Northeast Florida. But they don't have any money for Bibles. A lot of the money was spent and who knows where it was spent. The church is in a rebuilding process. So, one person, go back to Revelation 3.20. One person gets a burden. A woman named Daniela. She's sitting in this church watching these changes. Behold, I stand at the door and knock if any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him and will sup with him and he with me. Jesus knocked on that door three weeks ago. Daniela heard the knocking. She reached out to us for free Bibles to put in that church. 800 Bibles is what we're looking to put in that church. I have received so many messages, phone calls, messages, emails from, from people who are so excited to help us to do that. We need to raise $10,000 to put those Bibles into that church. Um, we have had a good response. We're not there yet, but we're getting there. Um, if you want to help us to do that, go to nowtheendbegins.com. Go to biblesbehindbars.com. We only have one real donation link. 
and click on it and make a donation and help us to raise money for 800 King James Pew Bibles for this former Rick Warren purpose-driven church. Daniela heard the Lord knocking on the door and she began to get a burden. At the same time, she's driving through downtown St. Augustine with her family. And what does she just happen to come across? The massive 10 by 40 billboard advertising the bookstore as the only Christian bookstore in St. Augustine, which is true. And so the Lord leads her to contact the bookstore, which is how she got in contact with Lori Ann. And then Lori Ann gave me the message and then I called Daniela. One woman in a church of a thousand people hears the knock on the door and already the wheels of change are starting to turn. They're starting to move. The rust is starting to be knocked off. Can you imagine what it would be like in Northeast Florida to have a brick-and-mortar church that used to be a Rick Warren church, a King James Bible-believing cathedral. Can you imagine that? I can imagine that. Jeremiah 33, 3, Call unto me, and I will answer thee, and show thee great and mighty things which thou knowest not. I don't know about you, but when I pray, I pray big. I pray large. And you know what? God has been answering those prayers over the last three and a half years to a very, very high degree. And I have had some time to watch him work and move. And what an amazing thing that he's been raising up between the NTEB bookstore and our Bible studies and the Sunday service and the podcast and our free Bible and gospel track program and the Bibles behind bars and all these things. If you would have told me this four years ago, that this is where you're going to be in 2023, I couldn't have believed it. I couldn't have imagined it. And yet that's where we are. If somebody would have told me four years ago, yeah, you're going to have this free Bible program. You're going to give a hundred Bibles for foster kid backpacks, tens of thousands of Bibles to jails and prisons. And uh, all these things are going to take place through this ministry. But this is what God's doing and this is what God is raising up. You know how the free Bible program started? It started with God in the end of 2018 telling me, why don't you reach into your pocket You have a lot of people who listen to the Bible study, but they can't afford a a good Bible. Why don't you give them one? That was just the Lord knocking on my door. There was no promises of that that would grow. He just said to me, would you be interested in helping some of your listeners to get a free Bible? And if you are, why don't you go ahead and do it? We're passing 150,000 free Bibles, um, New Testaments, and Scripture portions that we've handed out just in the last two years. Um, Well over uh, 100,000 free gospel tracts, probably closer to a quarter million. Uh, Very hard to keep track of those things. A lot of the times... People come into the bookstore and and they just have a need. And sometimes we write it down. Sometimes we don't write it down. Um, But the point of what I'm saying is, would you believe just like there are some people who think that giving Bibles to prisoners is a waste of time and money, there are also a few people who believe that putting 800 King James Bibles into the pews of a mega church is a waste of time and money. Well, I disagree. 
And I believe, based on how God is working, I believe that the Lord disagrees with that statement. Um, And look, I want to put these Bibles wherever and whenever we get the open door to do it. If God opened up a door tomorrow and said, you know what? I want you to put King James Bibles into every bus stop in Florida, every bus stop in the Northeast. If that's what God wanted, that's the direction that we would go. When Jesus is knocking on the door in Revelation 3.20, he is looking for one person to hear that knock, to open that door, and to sup with him. Now, what does that mean? To sit down and have a cheeseburger with the Lord? No. What it means is, Job 23.12, Neither have I gone back from the commandment of his lips. I have esteemed the words of his mouth more than my necessary food. Jesus stands at the door and knocks. It's not the door of your heart. It is the door that the Laodicean church has put him behind. And he is knocking and he is looking for door openers. Can you be a door opener in the house of the Lord? Because if you can, God's going to give you a job just like he gave me, just like he gave Lori and Jeanette, just like he gave Erad Bairumumishu and Kyle and Reagan Gorzell, just like he gave Daniela at this Crosswater Church. You want to get something done for the Lord? He's knocking, and he's been knocking the entire time. So why don't I hear him? I hear from people constantly. They tell me, I pray and I pray and I pray. And God, I don't ever hear from God. My advice would be to pray less and read more. The Bible is God talking to you. Your prayer is you talking to God. If you don't hear from God, it is highly likely you are either not opening up his word or you are not going into it as much as you should be. Job said that he esteemed God's word more than his necessary food. Well, let's think about it for a second. We wake up in the morning, we have coffee. That's food. We go from coffee to something for breakfast. That's food. And then in just about three hours later, We go for some kind of a lunch. That's food. Now, the distance between lunch and dinner is so long that we have to have a mid-afternoon snack. That's food. Then we have dinner, whatever that dinner is going to be. And then as we start winding our day down, we just need to nosh on a little something because we're just a little bit hungry. How many times do you eat during the day? I'm not talking about what you eat or how much you eat. I'm not talking about if it's all meat or all sugar or all carbs or no carbs or a bowl of vegetables or a bowl of Cool Whip. I'm not talking about that. How many times do you eat during the day? Well, you should be reading God's word an equal number of times. Now you say to yourself, well, there's no way I can do that. Well, if you can find time to eat six to eight times per day, is it not possible that you can find time to read God's word two or three times per day? Ten minutes at a clip? I think you can. And you know what happens When you read God's word like that, like you mean it, like you really want to hear from him, too many times we look at the Bible superstitiously. We want to keep it in our bedroom. 
so that we don't die during our sleep. We want to keep it close to our pillow so somehow magically that these things will seep into our heads. Um, Dawn is asking, what about the King James Bible in Romanian? I know of a need in a church. Uh, email me, info at nowtheendbegins.com um, and I will be happy to look into that for you. Uh, please email me about the Romanian King James Bibles and I will see what we can do. You see that? This sermon is already bearing fruit. Now, in closing, let me just say this. If you're waiting for the revival, you're going to be waiting in vain. National, corporate, international revival is not coming. Don't wait for it. Don't look for it. But the revival that is coming and the revival that you can look for and the revival that you can be a part of is the revival of what takes place when you get revived in God's word. The one person revival can still make a difference in these last days. Daniela contacted us three weeks ago. Multiple messages, multiple phone calls. It led to a meeting that lasted for just under three hours. One person making a difference, answering the knock on the door, and if we are able to raise enough money, we are going to put those 800 Bibles into that church, Crosswater Church, let the naysayers say what they want to say. I don't care. I'm not even listening because I know that this is what God wants us to do. And I'm excited that he continues to open new doors and new opportunities for us to get King James Bibles out too. And we are going to stand on the front lines and we are going to continue to do this together. And how exciting, how exciting it would be if everybody listening to this sermon would resolve within themselves that if God can do something with Erad Bairumumishu, in Uganda, and if God can do something with Kyle Gorzell, and if God can do something with with me, God can do something with you, and he can do great and mighty things in your life, but you got to be listening, you got to be willing to walk over to that door, and let me tell you something, when you open that door, And you say, here am I, Lord. What do you have for me to do? When he gives you that job, whatever it is, the main opposition that you're going to experience is from the lukewarm Laodiceans that you're surrounded with who don't want you to do the job that God has called you to do because it makes them look bad. So, when you answer that call, that's going to be really good for you. When you do the job that God wants you to do, and at this point, again, there's no global revivals. God's not raising up another Moody. There's not going to be, um, you know, sold out meetings, 20,000 people at a time lasting for a 25 year period. That's not coming. But what is coming is you can be a part of what I call this special ops forces. And we, it's like a sniper up on the roof. And God is just giving us targets. Send Bibles here. Send Bibles to this jail. Send Bibles to that prison. Send Bibles to the the ICE Migrant Detention Center. The first time we ever sent Bibles there, I was shocked. But God raised up somebody on the other end 
within that facility who listened to one of our podcast broadcasts and said, you know what? We need to get God's word into this migrant facility. And we've done that multiple times now. Thousands and thousands and thousands of Bibles into ICE detention centers for migrants. God can do great and mighty things through you, but you have to be willing to go it alone. You have to be willing to stand up and say to the lukewarm crowd, I no longer want to be typified by this inertia, this spiritual malaise. I want to be on fire for God. Let God set you on fire and see what a one-person revival can do. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord. We praise you. And Father God, I pray for this congregation, these tens of thousands of people who listen to these broadcasts every single week, Lord. And uh, God, you have raised up some some people who are willing to go it alone and people who are willing to stand against the crowd and say, Lord, here am I, send me, like Isaiah said in chapter 6. And Father God, I pray that even at this late hour, you continue to raise up men and women who are willing to stand against the Laodicean spirit to overcome the Laodicean spirit of the last day's church and say, Lord, give me a job to do. Give me everything that I need to do that job and I'll give you all the glory for it. And Father, we pray that you continue to give us souls for our labors and we'll just thank you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, I hope that this sermon was a blessing to you. And if you want to be part of sending these 800 King James Pew Bibles uh, to this church, just go to nowtheendbegins.com or biblesbehindbars.com and click on the donate link and help us to raise this money so that we can send out these Bibles. And um, I thank you very, very much for that. Lord willing, tonight... We'll see you back here 7 p.m. Eastern Time for part number four and our look at the Apostle Paul. Tonight, we're going to look at Paul writing Scripture. And um, he takes it from the Old Testament. But when it's done coming off of his pen, it is very, very much New Testament. And we're going to be looking at that tonight. Have a great afternoon, everybody.
now touring that holy city, shouting down an endless road, and I cried, I've made it, thank God I've made it, my feet have touched the streets of gold, streets of gold, I now am walking, just past by the tree of life, took a dream. mansion that won't grow old and I cried I've made it thank God I made it my feet have touched the streets of gold streets of gold I now am walking just past by the tree of life took a drink of living water flowing down from God That won't grow old And I cry I've made it Thank God I've made it My feet have touched The streets of gold And I cry I've made it Thank God I've made it My feet have touched The streets of gold 